Chapter 117 Where is she? Summary Izuku wakes up and something is wrong. His head hurts and something is wrong. He's not sure when the pain in his head started, but when the pulsing ache finally registers with his swimming mind, lurching him out of the warm days of sleep he was drifting in, he knows something is wrong. His arms are sluggish when he pushes himself up, squinting sleep-dusted eyes at the pastel walls and intricate molding along the ceiling. He was... This was... The strength quirk Deathworlder's planet. They'd agreed to stay for breakfast the next morning. They'd been pushing themselves too hard again, not taking the time to step back and relax. But they were going to stay for the feast. Stumbling, he slid off the too high bed, feet barely noticing the chill of the tiled floor. As he reached the crumple of black and red that was his suit, Still not sure of what was wrong, Izuku steps into the bodysuit and pulls on the rest of his clothes in less than a minute. The pastel pink door swung open silently, making his footsteps sound out of place in the silent hall. Though his head wasn't clear enough to dwell on the unsettling echo, muddled with pain and the still clinging fog of sleep. Without really thinking about it, Izuku makes his way to a seemingly random door across the hall and slips inside. On top of puffy aqua sheets, still dressed in his full costume attire, lies Kachan. He's asleep. Izuku can tell he's asleep by the lack of shouting at him for barging in. But it feels wrong. Not THE wrong, but still wrong. Why am I here? He nudges Kachan's side, once, twice, again and again, yet still no swatting his hands away with murderous grumbles, not even a twitch, which just isn't right. None of them are deep sleepers. They couldn't afford to be after everything. Focus seems to creep back into Izuku's head, each breath flushing out a little more of the clinging weight. Yet the feeling of wrongness doesn't change, tickling indistinctly in the back of his mind, along with the prickles of pain. He blinks at the room around him, at pink walls and sleep-ruffled sheets, not sure when he decided to get to Kachan's room, but grateful his friend was here. He'd be able to help, either put the feeling of wrongness into words and action, or get Izuku to snap out of whatever his brain was doing right now. If he would just wake up. Caught on, Izuku frowns, sitting beside him to poke him in the face. Come on, I need you. Something's up, and I can't tell if it's just me or something is actually wrong he says, giving the blonde a flick to the ribs, green energy crackling to boost the prod. Voicing the possibility that something wasn't wrong doesn't feel right. He can't help but frown at the thought. His head flares with a brief bolt of pain. A second later, Kachan's foot kicks him in the ribs, sending him off the bed and onto the ground. Hey! Izuku complains, rubbing his sore butt as he looks at a scowling Kachan, leaning over the bed's edge. Maybe don't fucking flick me? The blonde retorts snappily. Izuku puts on a pout. You wouldn't wake up. So you flick me. Kachan scoffs, swaying a bit in place, almost unsteadily. And we both know that's bullshit. You could breathe in my direction and I'd wake up. I don't do sleeping on random alien planets. Well, tell that to yourself, because you were dead asleep. Izuku retorts. A bad feeling starting to sink in, because he knows what Kachan is saying is true. 
or at least, it should be. Kachan stills, looking down at where he's half-tangled into the sheets and across to Izuku's sleep-tangled hair. This wasn't the plan, Kachan says, an uneasy levelness to his voice. What plan? Izuku's head pulses with the question. After that alien fucker told us to sleep in separate rooms, Pink Cheeks got that whole innocent look on her face that means she'll be doing the exact opposite of what she's just told. But we apparently fell asleep. That wasn't the plan. Izuku remembers. Why didn't he remember before? He was just going to wait until things quieted down before sneaking off to meet up with the others. Why didn't that happen? He can't remember falling asleep, just being so tired. Too tired. Something's not right, Izuku distractedly muttered, prodding at the feeling of wrongness that was still in his mind. We need to get everyone and leave. Couldn't agree more, Kachan quipped, pushing off the bed. Let's get the fuck out of here. Izuku follows Kachan into the next room, where Ochako is sprawled across the bed, like she was trying to fall off both sides of the bed at once, but failing spectacularly thanks to the size. It takes Kachan shoving her off the bed, not unlike what he's done to Izuku, to get her to wake up. Izuku doesn't wait for her to get dressed before rushing over to the next room. Denki and Mei both wake groggily, Izuku using more effort than should be needed to rouse them. He leaves Mei's room, instructions to ping the kiddo's location barely coming out before he's rounded the last door. When he pushes open pastel pink wood, his heart skips a beat. The room is empty. Poofy aqua sheets are rumpled, like someone had lied down for a quick rest. On a chair by the wall is Mina's suit, folded haphazardly, her collapsed helmet resting on top. The closet door is ajar, a few oversized clothes spilling out and over onto the floor. But no, Mina. This is wrong. This is the wrong. He backs out of the room, barely missing Denki in his haste. Whoa, dude, you good? The electric blonde asks. She's not here. Mina's not there. Frowning, Denki leans aside to look into the room. Could she be in the bathroom? There's no mistaking the worry in Denki's tone, but it doesn't feel like enough. Izuku shakes his head. Something is wrong, Denki. I I can't explain what or why, but Mina being gone is wrong. We need to find her. Now. Denki's face hardens with determined focus at his words. I'll look around the room to see if there's anything that could tell us where she is. Someone should find someone who works here and ask if anyone's seen her. Neither waste a second moving into action, and Izuku is down the hall in seconds, making a half-hearted effort to keep one for all in check. It doesn't take too long, but each second seems to make the pain in his head that much more noticeable. They look like a noble of some sort, if this planet even has those. Fancy robes swishing as Izuku comes to a stop in front of them. A nervous smile plasters itself on the sentient's face. Oh, one of our esteemed guests. I didn't think you'd be awake so soon, uh, early. What can I do for you? Izuku's gaze hardens. Where is she? The sentient doesn't answer. Pink, horns, names Mina, help dig your people out of the earthquake aftermath for hours. Where is she? It wasn't a question this time. Their big black eyes flick around nervously, never passing across Izuku, even for a second. I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. 
His head is pounding, and his brain is screaming that they're lying. He reaches forward, grabbing the front of the noble's robes in his hand and lifting them, despite the disparity in height. Now, I think you do. Where is she? He demands, the last words coming out as a growl. They don't speak this time, just shake their head side to side, eyes squeezed shut. Frustration bubbles in Izuku's gut. Something is wrong, something is wrong, something is very, very wrong. Panic crackles alongside the anger. He needs to find Mina. If you people have done anything to her, anything to hurt her, you'll have made an enemy of our entire planet. Nothing. Which doesn't just mean our government. She's my family, and if you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. Which includes my father, all for one, and my dad's. Probably the only two people on Terra that could stand a chance against him. And my mom, who even my father is scared of. Do you like keeping your insides the right way around? They look frantic at this point, staring at Izuku with dawning horror. You're the Trellin Scourge. The Wild Hunt. They all but whisper. Voice that of a man realizing the one he'd just offended wasn't an old traveler, but a wrathful god in disguise. We came here to help you, Izuku pleads. Just tell me where she is. But they don't say a word. They just hang there, like a person at the gallows. He knows they know, but they won't say anything. They can't be the only one here who could tell him what he needs, though. He lets them drop, barely giving them a second to stumble back on their feet before he's landing a punch to the side of their jaw. They drop again, but this time they land on the ground with a thunk. Their chest rises and falls with steady breaths of unconsciousness. He doesn't waste time hiding the unconscious body, just runs down the hall once again, looking for someone who might give him answers. Turns out that third time's the charm holds true here, as it's the third person he runs into who finally talks. Unlike the others, she's dressed simply, with an apron over her plain black dress and a rag in her hands. It trembles in time with her breath. The pink one, she... She looked like an Ilona, so they must have taken her to the hunting grounds. A cold chill spreads across Izuku's body. The... what? Kachan leers over her like he did with the last one, that time inconveniently coming in just in time to make them faint. You have five seconds to explain. The hunting crowns. The Ilona are tyrants, enemies of our planet. We hunted the ones that stained our planet with their presence decades ago. We have not stopped since. She got out, hatred clear despite her fear. I don't need your whole history. Where the fuck is she? Kotsky barks out. The arena under the building. There's an entrance somewhere in the Sovereign's office. Only the hunters know exactly where it is, but it's too late. She's been down there for hours. She'll already be dead.